that 1930 sky here at the Verrazano Narrows and the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which is right above me. Huge bridge. It's actually even uh, taller than the Golden Gate. And these are the, this is the swift moving Verrazano Narrows current separating uh, Brooklyn and Staten Island. This bridge was built in the 1960s. But during the 1930s, there was a lot of agitation to build some kind of connection to Staten Island, uh, to Long Island, across this narrows, because this is really the only point where it was possible. Uh, but the military, Department of War, it was called then, uh, turned it down every time because they were worried about the long construction process and the fact that they, if they ever needed to defend New York, they would need swift access of this heart, this strait, this narrow. So they they blocked it. They said a tunnel would be okay, but a tunnel. Uh, this is it's such a deep, very deep. It it goes very swiftly down once uh, you hit the water. So a tunnel was completely unpractical because the hills that are on both sides, just the, uh, the angle it would have to be built at, it wouldn't work. So they had to wait all the way to the 60s, so they finally were able to build a bridge here. And it's still a very, very much used bridge. But that's not what I'm talking about today. We're going to talk about the biggest robbery ever. Well, up to the 1930s, this was the biggest robbery ever. $427,000 be a ton of money today, somewhere between like 8 and $10 million today if it was stolen. And it's a really uh, interesting story because all the people involved Well, they sort of got away with it, in a way. They were either in jail already, dead, or one got away with it. It was 13 people total who pulled off this, this robbery, and it fooled police for a long time. And the whole uh, the story is, is pretty interesting. None of the money was ever recovered. And we're going to go through all the, uh, the steps. It took place right here in Brooklyn, close to where... I'm at now. So I figured I'd start here to give you a nice view of the harbor and the narrows. And you can see here too there's a Fort Wadsworth over there. And its counterpart, Fort Hamilton. Now Fort Wadsworth is just kind of a memorial site now. But Fort Hamilton, even though the actual old fort is gone, uh, it is still run by the Department of Defense. It is the only part of New York City that is still run by the Department of Defense. And the fort was originally built here to protect the Narrows. So they'd have a fort on this side, a fort on that side, and they used to have huge cannons on each one. So if any ship tried to get into this harbor, they'd have to go through some pretty rough firing. Now the the fort was built uh, in 1820s, I believe. 1825 to uh, 1831 was the construction. But for a while, they had the, the cannons there because the uh, you know it wasn't out of the realm of, of possibility that an invasion could come. Air, you know, airplanes, aircraft carriers were were new in the in the 30s and the 20s, so. You know, air, airplanes were still uh, on the make, uh, so if anyone was going to uh, attack the city, it would probably be by a ship. So they had to keep these cannons in operation, and every year they would fire them because they would have to make sure that they still worked. So before they would, they'd have to warn everybody in the area because they were extremely loud that this was the day they were going to fire the cannons. And so uh, every year that was an, uh, an annual event. These were huge cannons. I mean, they had a series of them, but the biggest ones were 12-inch 
cannons. In the 30s, they had three. They closed one in 37, one in 1942, one in 1943, and then they left some small ones, and they finally got rid of those in uh, 1948 and kept some mobile, uh, like, artillery cannons for a little while after that. But uh, by the mid-50s, they realized that it was a bit outdated to expect a sea invasion. So uh, they got rid of it and just turned it into a regular military base. Interesting story, but I'm getting a bit off topic. So let me go tell the story of the Ruble Ice Factory robbery of August 21st, 1934. And we are going to head to where the factory is, and I'll tell the story of how it got robbed. And here is where the Ruble Ice Factory used to be. And Ruble Ice was one of the biggest ice factories at the time in New York City. Ice was a big business back then because everyone, well pretty much most people, had ice boxes. Refrigerators were still a bit expensive. They were you know, anywhere from like 100 to $200, their money. So, you know, it was in the thousands in today's dollars. So. If, and they really, refrigerators really didn't become uh, universal until the uh, late 40s, 50s. Before that, everyone had to buy a big chunk of ice, usually twice a week, have it delivered to their house. The ice would melt into a drip pan, you have to dip it out. It was annoying, less efficient. But uh, the ice had to come from somewhere. And this was, you can actually see the old, the windows used to be some kind of storage place now but this was the main headquarters and this wasn't the building itself this it was robbed it was an armored truck delivering a boatload of cash here that was robbed and what happened was these 13 guys it started with just two small-time racketeers bootleggers ex bootleggers because prohibition uh, ended uh, December 5th, 1933. We're around Coney Island to the south. In that direction. And they were scouting places to rob. And then they saw a bank they were thinking about. And at the bank there was an armored truck. And they noticed that the people running this truck were kind of lackadaisical. They weren't, didn't seem to be taking their job very seriously. And they, so they told some higher ups about this possibility. They looked into it and they saw this spot as one of the prime spots where they can corner this truck and rob it. And a big plan was hatched out. The only uh, the problem was this area was pretty quiet except for right where this little parking area here was, it was tennis court. So there was a lot of people there usually playing tennis. So they couldn't, they had to be careful uh, with some crowd control. But the day of, they planned it out well. They had a guy with a little cart with a covered up machine gun in it. Now these little carts were pretty common around here because people, uh, guys, street vendors with who sold ice would come sometimes uh, the smaller dealers with little carts to pick up ice so it wasn't that uncommon and so he uh, waited here with the machine guns watched some people play tennis for a while and there's some newsreels really entertaining newsreels they're copyrighted unfortunately so I can't show them on this video but they of the interviews of the tennis players and they said they saw this guy out there and he seemed you know the having a good time watching them and one lady said that her ball went out into the street and the guy ran and got it for her and he, and she said oh he seemed like a real gentleman and anyway they had three people in stolen cars follow the armored truck and well they they from a distance of course and when it pulled up here they took strategic uh, locations and at the right moment when the uh, drivers of the truck got out, the uh, vendor 
uh, pulled the sheet over his cart. There's two machine guns. He gave one to one of his buddies, one to him. Uh, there's 13 guys. I think I mentioned that already. Uh, two machine guns, and then each one had a pistol. So they had a few on crowd control of the tennis courts, a few grabbing the cash. And a few lookouts for police, and they were able to, in three minutes, steal four hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars out of out of this car. They hopped in their stolen cars, drove away. Didn't have to shoot anybody. Nobody was hurt. Uh, people on the tennis court, I said they were shocked, but they, you know, they went to the ground like they said and, and just waded through it. But uh, at this point, their plan took an interesting turn. This was not a auto getaway. This was going to be a marine getaway because the shore is not very far away. And we're going to head there and show you what their next step was in this robbery. It was right here where the 13 robbers hopped on two boats with the cash in hand, abandoned their stolen cars, went out into the harbor over here. And as you can see, Verrazano is in the distance there. That's where we started the video. And the ice factory is about... Uh, Maybe three bo three blocks to the uh, west, uh, two blocks to the north of where we are. It was pretty close to the shore, and they picked this spot because it was a very busy um, boat traffic area. Because there's a lot of warehouses around here, including the Ruble Ice Factory, and people would uh, load boats and take whatever they had and take it to uh, usually Manhattan, but it could be other uh, parts of Long Island as well because they didn't have highways like the Bell Parkway yet. Brooklyn was notorious for being very hard to get around within a car. It would take, you know, all day to cross Brooklyn, they would say. So, you know, it was better if you were going to ship something from this area of Brooklyn, which is not very close to Manhattan, you would take it by boat. And so they knew this area was uh, packed and then they could kind of, even if they were being chased, they could probably get away with it because there would be so many people around them doing business and, and you know, not really concerned about them. But, uh, I mean, it was a pretty smart plan. It was, uh, the mastermind was uh, allegedly a guy named Frank Porosky, but he was better known as the Polak. Uh, he was a dock racketeer. Uh, so he knew the the shore pretty well. So it, it probably had something to do with the fact that this was a marine uh, getaway. But uh, not everything went perfect with the the getaway. They made it to the boats okay before the police uh, could catch up with them. But while they went out and they went to a location, I'm going to show you next. But before, while they were on the way to this location, one of the, the guys with a pistol, his gun went off accidentally. Uh, the story was it was he got it caught on a rope or something, and he shot himself in the leg. You know, point blank, and so it it was a terrible, gaping wound, <laughs> and he, he was bleeding profusely. I'm sure there was a lot of yelling and cursing going on, but uh, that was all you know part of the journey. And you know, armored truck robberies were not very common, uh, but payroll robberies were very common back then. It is almost seems like every day in, in a newspaper there was a story of someone's payroll getting robbed. Uh, 
I don't know how these these people carried around this money. I would have been very concerned just by the amount of robberies I've read about. But uh, people, a lot of people at this time didn't trust uh, banks. A lot of banks failed, 31 to 33. People lost their life savings. And so they, uh, they didn't give people checks. Most employees just paid their employees straight cash. So, you know, during payday, they'd have to, someone would have to go to the bank and get the cash to, to give everybody. And it was very common for those people to get robbed. And, uh, but this armored truck robbery, that was a rarity. The armored trucks usually didn't get robbed. And so this uh, was a pretty sensational uh, robbery. And, wh and whenever it was, the cops said that, you know, there's no way the guys are going to get away with this. They'll have them in a, a week and all that. But uh, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, they were a little flabbergasted. The Marine getaway really threw them off because they were thinking that these guys went somewhere, w w took the boats to go on a bigger boat and went somewhere far away like Philadelphia or something. And so they were totally on the wrong trail. But really, all they did was go to Far Rockaway. And we're going to go there next. Well, here we are on the Rockaway Peninsula, looking into Jamaica Bay. In the distance, you see John F. Kennedy Airport, which, of course, was not there in the 30s. Manhattan over there. And it was here where the two boats landed and were scuttled. And I have to make a correction from the last one. I said that Frank Peresky, the Polak, was the mastermind. He was one of them, but it was more actually George Keller, and he was the um, the dock racketeer, not not the Frank the Polak Peresky. So I apologize for that um, mistake there. But anyway, they they got off here, and this uh, interesting little beach, not too far away, but you know, it's sizable. Uh, distance, uh, maybe ten miles, uh, maybe not, probably not even ten miles. But they were able to get here undetected, uh, despite the fact that that one guy shot himself. And so after this, they went to, they got picked up in more stolen cars. Apparently, it was very easy to steal cars back then. You hear about it all the time. All the crimes you hear commit, they, they're always in stolen cars. And so they went to a, drove from here to a hideout in Manhattan over there, in the Upper West Side, in a um, one of the more uh, upscale houses of prostitution where they hid out for a while and were not caught. But uh, the, immediately, the guy that sh that shot himself, uh, they called one of their uh, gangland uh, doctors, paid him $1,000 to amputate the leg. But the guy died the next day anyway because he lost too much blood. Uh, the head of their uh, gang paid another $1,500, told the doctor to give him a nice burp, bring him to his family and uh, give him the money to have a nice burial. But instead... Um, they, he was stuffed into a bag and tossed in an alleyway. Uh, his name was Benny the Bum. Benny the Bum McMahon was his, the guy who was the first death uh, after this. He didn't make it. Didn't get his cut because he died. But the other guys all got away, at least temporarily. They uh, split the uh, money evenly. The cops could not find them. Uh, they gradually got clues over the years, but it was never, uh, they could never find any of the guys or determine for sure whether it was definitely those guys. And uh, like I said, it was 13 of them, 12 after that guy died. And another three died in the meantime, uh, gang related killings. Uh, the rest were all sent to jail for other crimes they committed. 
in the meantime. And the big break came in 1938, when finally one of the guys, Frank the Polak Pereski, told the, the story that he was uh, in jail for another robbery charge, and he was hoping that if he told, revealed the mystery of the ruble ice holdup, that they'd go a little lenient on him. It didn't work, but he told the story, and the cop went to verify it with uh, another member of the gang where they needed someone else to verify it to make sure it was true. And there was another member of the gang named uh, Ole Serving who was serving an 82-year sentence for kidnapping. And kidnapping was a a big problem after prohibition ended a lot of racketeers turned to, to kidnapping and there was a wave of it in uh, 19 early 1934 uh, and a lot of states up there kidnapping charges the state of Missouri even made it uh, penalty a death the death penalty for kidnapping so he was serving 82 years uh, he was already in his 40s so there's no way he was getting out alive so he had nothing to lose, so he verified this, that the story was true and the case was solved. Uh, a few people that were in jail, they, they, most of them had uh, pretty long sentences already, so they just, you know, they, they went to trial, but they just tacked on more years, it really didn't matter. Uh, only serving, actually, he was serving his 82 years, it was in Alcatraz at the time when he, he told this. And uh, he wound up... Um, a few years later, I think in the 40s, he winded up hanging himself in Alcatraz, so he died there. But uh, the police, it was a bit of an embarrassment because right after it happened, they made a whole bunch of statements saying that this, they were going to solve this, this crime real fast. They're going to get the money back. No big deal. The, the Ruble Ice Corporation actually offered a substantial reward. I believe it, it was. Uh, a thousand, two thousand dollars. If anyone had inf information that proved accurate on it, never got a cent back. All the money was spent or given to somebody. They never got any of the money back uh, for this gigantic robbery, which, like I said, was the biggest uh, of its time. Not sure exactly when it was surpassed, but it it, it was uh, it was embarrassing because they they never solved it. It was revealed when you know when the guy confessed about it. So. And it was uh, amazing is they kept, as the time went by and they still couldn't solve it, they went to the conclusion that these guys were like really high level mastermind criminals that pulled this off and that's why they couldn't get it. And it turned out that wasn't really true. They were just average gang people. Um, There's a couple higher ups, but most of them were just regular bootleggers who turned to other crimes. Uh, they weren't really professional. That, you know, I mean, they, I guess they were professional in a way, but. They weren't uh, exactly the people they thought they were getting. But the uh, the whole thing, very interesting story. And there's one that got away. The guy, his name was uh, Timmy O'Mara. He was the one in charge of the boats, of securing the boats, the stolen boats. And he never got caught. He was actually brought in for questioning once, but they couldn't uh, nail him down on anything, so they let him go. And so uh, he winded up getting away, sharing his part of the money, and uh, as far as uh, I could tell, never went to jail. So there was one guy that actually did get away with it completely. And that's why I, uh, it was such a fascinating crime. And uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing the story of it. Uh, please stay tuned for more great, interesting stories from the 1930s. Uh, I'm going to actually be taping a bocce tournament soon. Uh, not necessarily has to do with the 30s, so it's a little offshoot work, but uh, should make an interesting video. And I'm going to do with uh, the Bremen story uh, about a group of young people that stormed a German boat and caused an international incident because they tore uh, down the Nazi flag and threw it into the water 
and uh, created a bunch of hoopla. And uh, but it's 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 a good story um, about relations at the time. At the time being uh, 1935. But stay tuned for that, and I thank you for watching.